Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the beautiful National Museum of the American Indian. And this is our Rasmussen Theater, and we're very excited and honored that all of you are here today for a very special program featuring Pat and Billy Mills. You know what you're here for. You're going to hear some inspirational stories. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple items with everybody, so thank you for your kind attention. Once again, I do want to welcome everybody and thank you for being here, especially any of our elders that are here, our members of mu our museum that may be here. We certainly couldn't do our work without your membership, so thank you for your support of the museum. There are also some guests that I do want to recognize and honor if they are here, so please feel free to stand and be recognized. Uh, if there's any of the staff from Running Strong for American Indian Youth, perhaps Mr. and Mrs. Jean Krizek are here. Are you with us this afternoon? Okay, they're coming. <laughs> well, let's give it up for our friends at Running Strong for American Indian Youth. You may know that it's, his, it's an organization that is very near and dear to Billy's heart that he's been involved with, that he helped co-found many years ago, and they do very, very good work in Indian country, and we are proud that they're here with us and have worked with the museum, in fact, helping us with our exhibit upstairs. You may have seen it on the second floor. It's called Best in the World. Native Athletes in the Olympics. So if you've not seen that exhibit, I highly recommend that you try to catch it before it leaves, and it leaves us in early September. We also uh, may have folks from uh, Let's Move in Indian Country and the Bureau of Indian Education. Are any of those folks here with us today? That's, a, that's an initiative as part of the Let's Move initiative of Mrs. Obama that tries to uh, create healthy lifestyles for young and old alike, and there's also an initiative now in Indian Country for that. The Department of Interior is certainly involved with that. Is there anybody with us from the Department of the Interior today, the federal government? So they are one of the partners with uh, the White House for that endeavor. And then WorldFit. If there's anybody from WorldFit, please stand. WorldFit is a group of Olympians and Paralympians that teach fitness, they mentor, they teach good diet and fitness and healthy lifestyles. So all of these organizations, as well as many others, are either involved directly or indirectly, both with health and fitness in Indian country and, of course, of course, across the nation as well. There is a special group of people that I do know some of them are here today, and I do want to recognize them, and, and Billy and Pat may mention them as well. But we do have some folks here from the Mikisu Cree First Nations, and they're one of the First Nations people from Canada. If you're here, please join us. We have Lawrence Cotere. Philip Torango, and then we also have uh, one of the very special financial partners with the First Nations a group from Mikisu Cree, and that's Stephen McCasey's. And I know Mr. McCasey's here as well. So thank you for joining us today. So we do thank you for all the standard theater etiquette. If you have a cell phone, please turn it off or put it on vibrate so it doesn't ring during the presentation. Uh, Billy and Pat have graciously permitted photos to be allowed to be taken. We just ask that you do that very judiciously and respectfully so you don't make your neighbor crazy who's sitting next to you. So <laughs> we ask your respect with that. There is no audio or video recording, however, so please do not video record with your cell phone. We have some copyrighted materials, and we ask your cooperation with that. There's no tweeting or texting. Please no texting during the live program. At the very end of the program, uh, Billy and, and Pat will uh, entertain some questions if we have time at the very end. So if you have some questions about today's program or their work and who they are and what they do. Um, I also want to let you know that we have many upcoming programs here at the museum, one of which is our annual Living Earth Festival, which happens July 20, 20th through 22nd. And then we also have a Peruvian festival from July 25th through 30th. So please feel free to check out any of our upcoming programs. So thank you for your kind attention, and let's get started with the program. And before we have Billy speak to us today, I would like to introduce his wonderful wife of many years, Mrs. Pat Mills. Can you hear me okay? I'm going to start by telling my story, and then afterwards we're going to unveil the painting, and it will be ex 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 exhibited on the big screen. Being asked to do a painting of Billy Mills for the World Olympic Museum for their permanent collection actually had me reflecting back on our journey as well. 
New Year's Day is like that for a lot of people. Resolutions, vows, and promises of change. The desire to live one's life and have it improve is nearly universal. For most, that means leaving something behind. But for me, however, it was just the opposite. And I found myself remembering a warm summer evening in Kansas when I was nine years old. I was at my great-grandmother's farm, and as I stared out the front door at the prairie beyond, I picked up a pencil and began drawing. I drew the world through that doorway as I perceived it to be. It was a child's drawing, nothing more. But as I drew, it, it was as if I heard a word, a, a word whispering to me, this is what I meant to do. That same summer on, a, on, in a, on the steps of a small ramshackle home in Pine Ridge on the Indian Reservation in South Dakota, a 12-year-old Lakota named Billy Mills was mourning the death of his father. It was hard for him. Billy was especially close to his father, not only for his kindness and patience, but for the fact that his father had always encouraged him to chase his dream. I hope you try sports, son, he whispered, not long before he passed away, and another dream was born. Billy wanted to be an Olympian. Youth is a period when most dreams are sparked to life, and for a lucky few, they continue to burn long enough to be realized. In 1961, I met Billy Mills while we were students at the University of Kansas. I was a young artist, and he was a young athlete and the attraction was immediate. We spent long hours walking and talking, and he kissed me for the first time on Campanile Hill, and I knew I'd fallen in love. We were married on January 27, 1962, and by that point in his life, that fire that had driven him to be a scholarship athlete and has nearly been extinguished. He'd had a falling out with his coach, he'd quit the team, and he had decided to stop running entirely. But that original spark still remained. Maybe because of our relationship, or maybe because of the memories of his father were still vivid, he graduated from college, was commissioned an officer in the Marine Corps, and began to train for the 1964 Olympics. A year and a half later, he made that team, but was regarded as a long shot to earn a medal. Instead, in what many sports writers regard as the greatest Olympic upset of all time, he won the gold medal in 1964 and set a new Olympic record. The following year, he followed that up with a world record in the six-mile run. Despite marriage, athletic competitions, life in the Marine Corps, and children, I earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of New Mexico. After that, I settled into a life that in nearly way, every way, was everything I'd hoped it would be. As our family grew, I helped build our family's various businesses, including a speaker's bureau and 10K Gold product promotions, from which came the film Running Brave and the book Lessons of a Lakota, which was co-written with Nicholas Sparks, and a book in which I was responsible for the illustrations. I was active in many charities, including Running Strong for American Indian Youth, a program implemented by Christian Relief Services. And yet, like Billy in 1962, when that spark to chase his dream was reignited, I felt that same spark pertaining to my own dreams on that January 1, 2000. That summer, I traveled to France, and I spent a month in Monet's Gardens in Giverny reawakening a passion that had first been kindled by staring through that doorway on that Kansas prairie when I was nine. For years, I'd learned to listen to the inspiration and worked on my two posts, which is Greek for impression and form. Discovering who I was as a painter, i had always been drawn to the abstract, and yet I could feel the influences that had shaped me. Doorways and dreams, marriage and motherhood, Light and Shadow, Monet and Matisse. I sought to capture the movement of life in light and shadow, in vivid color and in images.
By 2007, I had completed my Master's of Art degree at California State University, Sacramento. Shortly after, Billy and I were visiting the World Olympic Museum in Lausanne, Switzerland, and we were moved emotionally to view the memorabilia, the paintings, and the sculptures, and to read the stories of these various Olympians' achievements. Achievements all based on dreams and hope, powerfully displayed and being shared with the world. The museum was preparing an exhibit entitled World Tour of Hope. Some of the athletes featured in this were Jesse Owens, Muhammad Ali, and Billy Mills. We met with the museum personnel and discussed Billy's athletic and post-athletic highlights. They were very moved by the legacy that emerged and were much in awe that the parallels between Native American values and virtues paralleled the Olympic values and virtues. At the conclusion of our meeting and after reviewing my website, the museum personnel asked if I would do a painting of Billy for their permanent collection. At this time, we will unveil that painting. At the same time, the painting will be projected on the screen, and I will discuss some of the uh, elements of the painting at this time. Billy. <laughs> so as you, can you hear me now? I'm going to be looking at the painting. As you see, uh, I, I named this painting Torch of Memory. So I wanted to have a fire element in here to represent torch, but then also with memory, what is left over after fire? It's smoke and ashes. So on the right hand side, you'll see some kind of smoky look and with some reds and oranges behind it. So that's, that's the smoke, that's the actual memory. And um, you'll see I have the Olympic rings that have been deconstructed and hanging off of the Olympic rings is a dream catcher. And I have Billy in a drum, he's in a drum, he's in a Lakota drum, so he's inside and outside of the drum at the same time. And you'll see the, the four columns up on the upper right hand corner that represents Grecian columns and, and Greece and the ancient uh, Olympics and that is actually painted in um, gold paint and the, on the horizon you'll see some figures underneath his elbow those are his ancestors exalting at his win and uh, the one that's kind of bent over he's like so overcome emotionally by the moment. And then on the left hand side underneath the uh, columns you'll see some dancers and those are native dancers and they're, they're dancing forever. They're always dancing Billy's deeds right there forever. And so I have him on a, on a horizon with, with the sky and the atmosphere behind him with some clouds and in the far distance you'll see Mount Olympus. And then the final thing you'll see, I've outlined him in blue, which to the Lakota is virtue and truth. So I wanted to kind of encase him in the color blue. And then finally, the image that I chose uh, to portray Billy is after he won the gold medal. And this is like, I can't believe I did this. And uh, so, because the other paintings and the other iconic images you've seen of Billy, he's like crossing the finish line. This one I wanted to have it be uh, one step further. So from here the painting is going to uh, the Olympic Games in London where it'll be on exhibit at the Art of the Olympians uh, exhibit during the Olympic Games. And then from there, it's going to the museum in Lausanne, Switzerland for, for their permanent collection. And now it gives me great pleasure to in, introduce the subject of the painting, Torch of Memory, Olympic gold medalist Billy Mills.
so perhaps the most effective way to introduce Billy is by showing a short DVD of the last lap of his 1964 Tokyo 10,000-meter win. And you can see through the, that the torch of memory is being born at this moment. And look for Billy. His number is 722. 1964. Some of the athletes from various teams have broken ranks. Together, the noise of our guys now passing by the bands and through those traditional Japanese drums. of all the nations. Now we're coming to one of the most impressive moments of the Olympics as Sakai will turn and salute the crowd before igniting the cauldron which will burn throughout the Olympic Games until the closing ceremonies and it will be extinguished. produced an amazing finish by Billy Mills. And here we go in the final lap for the gold medal in the 10,000 meter. And up front is Bill Mills. He's pressing Ron Clark, the world champion. Bill Mills in the United States, number 722, is leading Ron Clark. And in third place right now is Mahout Bakamuti of Tunis. A tremendous upset of Bill Mills can hang on. But Kamuti goes out ahead as Kamuti right now leading in the 10,000 meter. Ron Clark is third. Rather, Bill Mills is in third. Ron Clark is in second right now. This is the final lap for the 10,000 meter. The unheralded Mahout Kamuti of Tunis is putting on a tremendous sprint. He's out ahead of Ron Clark. Bill Mills, the United States, is in third place. And this will certainly be the fastest 10,000 meter ever run by an American. Here is Mills who seems to be boxed in. Suddenly, there's an opening, and here he comes. Here they come down the final out. Can Ron Clark catch the Moody? They're going through the field. He's coming up. He's passing the Moody. Look at Look at Mills. Look at Mills. Coming on. Mills is coming on. Oh. It might be Bill Mills. What a tremendous surprise here. Bill Mills in the United States wins the 10,000 meters. Bill Mills in the United States, a tremendous upset, wins the 10,000 meter here. He's on hell with others. Kansas. Let's go back and look with our other camera to see exactly how he broke through the pack. Here they come down the final out. Can Ron Clark catch the Moody? They're going through the field. He's coming up. He's passing the Moody. Look at Look at Mills. Look at Mills. Coming on. Mills is coming on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it might be Bill Mills. What a tremendous surprise here. <laughs> Bill Mills in the United States wins the 10,000 meters. Billy Mills, the only American ever to win a gold medal in the Olympic 10,000 meter run. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Mr. Billy Mills. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Th thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> th thank you. Thank you. Wow. It, it's so difficult to make any comments after being honored in the way I have just been honored. But that moment is what we honored. What's happened after that moment is what we honored, not me. That moment was very, very special to me. I, I truly felt as if I had wings 
on my feet. I was told the moment was magical. I was told the world had just witnessed the greatest upset in Olympic history unfold. I was told it was electrifying. However, that's not what I took from sport. What I took from sport today could be considered two or three of the greatest challenges or lessons we face in the world today. I took, for example, it's the journey, not the destination as an athlete. That empowered me. It was the 60,000 miles in training, in preparation, in study, not breaking the tape, that empowered me as an athlete. It's the daily decisions I made for 15 years of training. It's the daily decisions we make in life, not just the talent we possess, that choreographs our destiny. Now traveling to 106 different countries, a half a dozen times around the world, I took a true sense of global unity through the dignity, through the character, through the beauty of global diversity. Unity through diversity. Not only the theme of the Olympic Games, far, far more significant. The future of humankind. I was nine years old when I read my first Olympic book. And, and the book quoted the Greeks who said, Olympians are chosen by the gods. Now, I like that comment. <laughs> I wanted to be chosen by the gods, not because of the Olympic Games, simply because my mother had just died. And I thought if I was chosen by the gods, even if they were the Olympic gods, I would be able to see my mother again. The book also quoted Socrates and a few other philosophers from which came, with achievement comes honor. With honor comes responsibility. My father then took me into Native American storytelling, culture, tradition, spirituality, and said, we don't tell stories just to tell stories. We tell stories to teach lessons. And depending upon the level of responsibility with accountability we assume in our life, there's a different lesson. There's a different consequence. So as a youngster, I'm taking Greek mythology, Native American storytelling, culture, tradition, spirituality, blending them, and I found Olympic idealism. <laughs> Global unity through the dignity, character, beauty of global diversity, the future of humankind. It's the journey, not the destination, that empowers us, and it's the daily decisions we make in life, not just the talent we possess, that choreographs our destiny. But there's always obstacles in the road. There's always perceptions we face. And America today is battling with some incredibly frightening perceptions, simply because so many of our people so many of our leaders don't want to listen to one another. They don't want to work together. I remember my dad, again, shortly after my mother died. We're fishing. He hugged me. He squeezed my arm. He stroked my shoulder and said, son, you have broken wings. And I started to cry. Today I cry because so many of our young indigenous people have broken wings. Devastating epidemics of suicide. Diabetes, rampant throughout Indian country. Broken families. Broken promises. Broken hearts. My dad sim simply said, son, you have broken wings, but I'll share something with you. And if you follow it, someday you may have wings of an eagle. He took a stick. He drew a circle. 
Step inside of the circle, son. I remember stepping inside. I'm nine years old. Look inside of your heart. He closed my eyes. He put his hand on my chest. Look inside of your heart, your body, your mind, your spirit. What do you find? I'm too young to understand. Boom! He clapped his hands. I'll tell you what you find. Anger. You just lost your mother. Today we find anger among many of our leaders of this great country. At each other. You have anger, son. And you have a whole lot of self-pity. You have jealousy, son. The, je the jealousy blinds you. You don't see the beauty in our own culture, in our own family, in other cultures, in other people. And you have a whole lot of self-pity. All of those emotions, son, will destroy you. Look deeper, way down deep, are where the dreams lie, son. Find your dream. It's the pursuit of the dream that'll heal you. My dad died when I was 12. I was blessed with strong brothers and sisters. I was blessed by meeting friends as I went off to Haskell, like your husband, Ted Lewis, who inspired me as much as anybody to be better because he always beat me. I've been blessed in my life. But what I'd like to say we have responsibility and we have accountability. I'm off at Haskell Indian School. I started running track. My dad died. I hope you try sports, son. I wanted to be an athlete. My sophomore year in high school, I lived in the back seat of an old car, worked over the summer months building grain elevators sleeping in the back seat of a car, bathing in the creek. But I found time to train, running an hour a day, because I wanted to be an Olympian. Graduated from high school, scholarship to the University of Kansas. The first three times I made All-American. I remember the words, you, yeah, you're the darker-skinned one. We want you out of the photo. I broke. I stepped out. The next year, you, you, the Indian guy, I'll take two photos, one without you, one with you. A little bit of me broke. The next year, Mills, congratulations, three times. Three times All-American. I want to take two photos. The first one without you, the next one I'll take with you. I forced the photo, but I broke. I go back to my hotel room. I'm on the fourth or sixth floor. I'm on a chair. And I'm going to jump. But I want to tell you why I didn't jump. I didn't hear it through my ears. I heard underneath my skin. Don't. Don't. Then loving, soothing, don't. I thought it was my dad's voice. I remembered that I needed a dream to heal a broken soul. I got off the chair and I wrote, gold medal, 10,000 meter run. Believe, 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 believe. Graduate in college, Patricia and I went off to the Olympic Games. It's time for my race. I get on the bus to go to the track. I'm being paged. I go back inside of the village where we were living. I pick up the phone. It's my sister from the reservation. I hope we're not bothering you, Billy. We love you. We've been praying for you. Regardless of what happens, we, and then I heard, we're disconnected. 
But the simple thought, somebody back home is thinking about me, somebody cares, somebody loves me, the confidence went up. I got on the bus. Here's the aisle of the bus. Two vacant seats. Over here's a vacant seat by Randy Matson, 285-pound shot putter from Texas A&M. Off of here is a vacant seat by a very beautiful young lady from Poland. And obviously, I, I ignored Randy. <laughs> I sat by the beautiful lady from Poland, and it was a big mistake. She spoke perfect English. Ah, USA. Yeah, USA. What event are you in? I'm, I'm in the 10,000-meter run. Ah, today's the final, isn't it? Yeah, today's the final. Who do you think is going to win? You, you don't ask somebody that. Especially somebody who grew up in a dysfunctional family. Dysfunctional himself. I, I could not respond. She tapped me on the shoulder. Who's going to win, Clark the world record holder or Peter Blitnikoff, the defending champion from Russia? Now she's given me a choice. That did not include me. I dug down as deep as I could. I quietly came up with, I, I'm going to win. <laughs> well, what's your name? Billy Mills. Oh. No more dialogue. We go to the track. We go through the warm-up. The race got underway. Lap after lap, runners fall behind. We cross the three-mile. For those of you who run, on a cinder-muddy track, 13 minutes and 29 seconds. Two problems. I'm in fourth place. That's the small problem. The big problem, I'm within one second of my fastest three-mile ever, but the race is not three miles. It's 6.2 miles. I can't continue. I'm going to quit. When you quit a distance race, you look into the infield, you want to quit when nobody recognizes you. I looked into the infield, all of the officials are local Japanese people from Tokyo. I'm an Ogallala Lakota from Pine Ridge. Anywhere was a great place to quit. But you also look into the stadium. I am running 80,000 people cheering, screaming, and I look into the stadium and I'm on the verge of quitting. Far faster than I'd ever run before. But who do I focus on? I focused on my wife, Patricia. She's crying. Not, not because I'm going to quit. But we made a commitment. She came into my world. And I was learning her world. We made a commitment based on Native American virtues and values. And we committed to those virtues and values. Stumbling many times along the way, but a commitment was made. She was crying because of the first world record in my family, set by my adopted sister, who had 24 children. No, 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 that's not the world record. No. <laughs> However, of, of the 24 children, she had eight sets of twins. Crying because I couldn't join a fraternity in college. And it was not the University of Kansas. It was America. You can't join because you're Indian. There's absolutely nothing you, you can contribute. Not able to room with two dear friends of mine because one man's white, one man's black, and I'm Indian. And the three of us not allowed to expand upon the love, the diversity, the, com the compassion we can empower one another with. She's crying for another reason. After my younger brother Chet was born, our mom and dad divorced. That's this audience. Our mother remarried. Our mother remarried my dad's younger brother. <laughs> so my uncle became my stepfather. My mom died of cancer, tuberculosis, diabetic, age 42. So my uncle, or my stepfather, remarried. Remarried my mom's younger sister. <laughs> I've never counted, but multitudes of perceptions that go along with that. And as First Nations people, as indigenous people throughout the world, as Native Americans, there are multitudes of perceptions people have of us. Our world is changing so rapidly today. There's no way I could quit. I had to participate. I had to choreograph my journey into this vast universe of opportunity that awaited me. And we helped to help our young people choreograph their journey I continued, lap after lap after lap, <laughs> to where the video picked up the race. 
One lap to go. I moved into first place. Right on Ron Clark's shoulder. He pushed me into the third lane. I stumbled. I closed back on his shoulder. Gamuti from Tunisia broke between us. And I quit. I didn't quit the race. I was going to try to win the race. But I was going to quit in the most cowardly way of all. I took off after Clark. And for pushing me. I was going to catch him and hit him. You know? The most cowardly way of quitting. It was basically virtues and values. The virtues and values I trained on, the Native American, American virtues and values I was trying to implement in my life. Just one more try, one more try, one more try. I started to go low blood sugar. One year before the Olympic Games, I was diagnosed as hypoglycemic. Some of you saw me carry some orange juice up here. It's kind of like my super drink when I go very low quickly. And I was nervous because my wife was making some comments. And I was rapidly going low blood sugar. I started to go low blood sugar in my race. You get a sticky, clammy sweat, shaky, blurred vision. I didn't know if I could go with the runners. I decided to let them get maybe 10 to 12 yards ahead of me. I'd make one final try coming off the curve. They're now 12, 15 yards ahead of me, 200 meters to go. 85,000 people screaming. All I can hear is the throb of my heart, a tingling sensation creeping down my forearm, my vision coming and going. Now, I've got to try to catch them now, lifting my knees, pumping my arms, coming off the final curve, eight yards behind, 100 meters to go, eight meters behind. That's a lot of distance to make up. Now, now, lapping runners, Clark, Gamuti, me, a lap runner stepped in front of me, Lutz Philip from Germany. I'm boxed in. I can't go inside of him. I have to go another three or four yards to get around him. I'm on the verge of panic. 85,000 people screaming, the throbbing of my heart, the tingling sensation. What do I do? Lutz looked and he saw me coming. He moved into the fifth lane, opened up the fourth lane for me. Now, now lifting my knees, pumping my arms. As I go by Lutz, Philip, I glanced to make sure he didn't cut in too soon and accidentally tripped me. I looked at him, and he turned toward me. In the center of his jersey was an eagle. <laughs> was an eagle. Back to my dad. Son, if you do these things, someday you'll have wings of an eagle. Wings of an eagle. I can win. I can win. I can win. 30 yards to go. I saw the tape stretched across the finish line. My thoughts became, I won, I won, I won. Then I felt the tape break across my chest. A Japanese official came up to me. Who are you? Who are you? I responded with, oh my God, did I miscount the laps? Do I have one more lap to go? Finished, finished. You are the new Olympic champion. I went to find Lutz Philip to tell him the singlet, the eagle on his jersey helped me win the Olympic gold medal. I found him. There was no ego. It was simply a perception. We have many of our young people today going on to accomplish great things because of perceptions and how they dealt with perceptions. But we have many who have signed a note and they've taken their life. And the notes have simply said, Nobody cares. I don't feel I belong. It's my last attempt to show a badge of courage. I'm taken to the award ceremony. I'm on the victory stand. There's no more beautiful music to hear than our national anthem when you're representing our country and you're on the number one position at the Olympic Games, having a gold medal put around your neck. But I want to tell you what I felt, which overpowered all emotions. I felt my dad's words. Son, you can step out of the circle now. Perhaps that's why she has me halfway in the circle of the drum and halfway out. I don't know, but those are my thoughts. Son, you can step out of the circle now. Look beyond the hurt, the hate, the jealousy, the self-pity, 
All of those emotions will destroy you, son. Look deeper. Way down deeper where the dreams lie. Find your dream, son. It's the pursuit of the dream that heals you. I felt him saying to me through feeling, take the foremost powerful virtues of our people. Bravery, fortitude, wisdom, generosity. And here's how you use them. You take, you take bravery and fortitude. And you go on a journey to the center of your soul. And that's where you find the virtue of wisdom. You use the virtue of wisdom to make the right choices for yourself. The right choices will empower you. Then you go to the virtue of generosity, and you empower others. When you do that, son, you're becoming a, you are becoming an emerging elite warrior. Responsibility with accountability. Humility. The power of giving. Centered around a core of spirituality. And there are four spiritual steps the warrior seeks to fulfill. To be unique. To belong. To make a creative difference to society. And to understand. And I say through understanding... Promote global unity through the dignity, character, beauty of global diversity, the future of humankind. Many, many of our young indigenous people, First Nations people in Canada, Native Americans in the U.S., Aboriginal, globally, are pursuing their dream for the betterment of themselves, for the betterment of their families, for the betterment of their nation, for the betterment of the world. And I felt I had a simple obligation in my, in my life. I felt me winning a gold medal at the Olympic Games was a gift to me from higher power. And I wanted to take that one moment in time and give back. And thanks to Jim Kresak and his family, we joined together and formed Running Strong for American Indian Youth. And we've been able to make tremendous, tremendous positive programs on the reservations for the benefit of our people. I don't know if Brad Englander is in the audience, but his father, Ira Englander, having enough faith in Pat and I to do the movie Running Brave. A young girl from... Tibet told my wife nine months ago, talking to Patricia, where are you from? I'm th in the United States. Where are you from? I'm Tibetan, but I live in northern, was born in northern India, but I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa now. I'm a tribal person. Started talking about tribalism. She looks at my wife and said, I'm born you. No, 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 you're not born me. My husband's tribal. What tribe? Well, he's from the Ogallala Lakota Nation, state of South Dakota, the United States of America. This young Tibetan girl, because of your father, believing in Patricia and I, said, oh my God, you mean Billy Mills? My wife, shocked. You've heard about my husband. Yes, my older brother in this rapidly changing world has told me and my parents, as a young woman, I have to prepare for this rapidly changing world. I have to play my part in making the world better for our indigenous people and for our, all people. My older brother is teaching me about successful indigenous people worldwide. Your husband has become the first lesson. What I'd like to do to the people I mentioned and many, many more of you, and the Mikasu Cree First Nations people, and to my wife, Patricia. I want to close by dedicating a 90-second video about dreams. The Mikasu Cree First Nation, Northern Canada, are the patron of the movie Running Brave. They're donating it to the World Olympic Museum. So 350 to 500 million indigenous people traveling worldwide may see a successful indigenous person who's achieved, perhaps be inspired to move forward in their life to make the world a better place. So if we can have what I call my warrior video, it's a 90 second video, you read captions on the top and bottom of the screen, Judy Collins plays Amazing Grace, I call it my, my video of dreams, and I dedicate it to the people mentioned because they've all helped me fulfill a dream of mine. 
and that's to make the world a better place. Let's have the video, please. As the lights come back on and we make a transition into a question and answer period, I'd love for the three representatives from the Miccosu Cree First Nation people, if the council member, Philip, Lawrence, and Steve, if you'd be willing to come up, and my wife, Patricia, because we're going to have a question and answer period, and I want to, at this point, let you hear a few comments from the Mikasu Cree, First Nations, former chief or current council member. And I think you can either you stay there, Lawrence, or you can use this, but I'd love to hear some comments from you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lawrence Kudere. I am the general manager for the group of companies for Mikasu Cree. Uh, I come from a community that's in northeastern Alberta, very close to the Northwest Territories border. For years, we've been successful in businesses. And uh, I'll tell you a little story of how I met Billy. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce our one of council members, Philip Taranjo. Would you come up here, Philip? He's one of our young leaders in our community. This is second term in council, and uh, we have a very outgoing, far-reaching, far-looking leaders in our community. And our new partner that we've joined relationship in business is Stephen McCasey from Toronto. He's with Dundee, and he's a, he owns a company called Lynx Resourcing. Last February, I went to an event in Fort McMurray, Alberta, where the producer of the oil sands, uh, the big debate in the United States over the Enbridge pipeline, the tar sands, etc. Well, we live in the midst of the, of the development and the industrial conglomerates and uh, oil plants, etc. Primarily from the United States, obviously. So, in the, uh, every year we honor our people in our communities through achievement awards in the region, uh, youth, elders, etc. And I happen to be one of the presenters of an award. And the guest speaker was Billy. So I listened to the stories. I saw the video. I was really excited. I knew the story because I had seen uh, Running Brave, actually, which was financed by another Alberta First Nation group, the Irminskin people outside of Edmonton, Alberta. So 
About midnight, I thought, geez, I'm a little hungry. I'm going to go downstairs and have some meat. And lo and behold, there's Billy sitting by himself. So I introduced myself. Then we had, we, had, uh, we had a nice quiet meal and we talked and exchanged our history and some of our achievements and some of our downfalls in life. And as he told me the story of the painting, etc., it dawned on me that this might be an opportunity for us in our quest to have people like Bill who have achieved, who accomplished despite all the hardship in life this would be the ideal project for our First Nation, particularly in our interest in developing our youth. So I phoned my friend in Toronto, and I said, Stephen, I've got a project here you might be interested in. We have an outstanding athlete, no doubt an Oglala Lakota member, and he doesn't have a painting in this place. It's going to cost us only this amount of money. Let's do it. So he calls me back and he says, let's do it. So I phoned Pat, who had met them on the phone, and she said, we'd love you guys to do it for us. So here we are today. You did a wonderful job. We congratulate you. And Mikasu will be very proud to have our name attached to that. But more importantly, I think we developed a strong relationship with Billy. And uh, I think that uh, we want to, we as... We call ourselves Aboriginal people, and in the United States, we, with the American, uh, Native Americans, we fought in Geneva and all over the world. We said, we're not Aborigines, the Aboriginal lives in Australia. But I know we took on the responsibility to identify as Aboriginal people and as First Nation members. We are the fastest growing population in Canada, and we face the same problems as a lot of uh, Aboriginal people or Indigenous people, Native Americans across the United States. Poverty, gangs, a lot of violence, all those high statistics. So we are now getting control of our own life by looking at businesses, looking at opportunities, because economic power gives you political power. So now what we have to do is develop our own resources to enhance our youth not only to be athletes, but to be very powerful people and leaders in the future. And that is why we supported this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have, we have some time, if they can project the painting back on the large screen. And any questions you might have for the artist Patricia, or the patron, or the Mikasu Cree Nation, and I have a microphone, so if you do have a question, everybody can hear you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, here we go. My question is for you, Billy. Did uh, Ron Clark or Gabuti ever apologize to you for the jostling on the track? Did Ron Clark or Gabuti ever apologize? You know what? I, I love that question very quickly. We met Mohammed Gabuti's daughter three months ago in UCLA. And here's the true feeling. She said, my daddy was so, so happy for you when you won. And I said, well, tell me why. And she said, 30 meters to go. My daddy looked, and Ron Clark was not gaining on him. He looked and could not see you. 30 meters was the finish. 30 meters to go, and he's the Olympic champion. My daddy told me you were a Native American, and you were like an arrow being shot out of a bow. You went by me, and you won, and he was so, so happy. And I said, well, why, why did he feel so thrilled for my victory? Billy, my daddy was thrilled for you because he knew that moment was a gift to you from your creator. And the most sacred thing she could have ever said, because everything I've attempted to do in life, and Patricia painting for the World Olympic Museum, Mikasu Cree being the sponsor, Englander Productions for the movie. Kresek, running strong. It's all been because they've also all felt that moment was a gift to me. So you have to give back. Thanks for the question. Somebody else have a question? How long did it take for you to draw that painting?
took me about eight weeks of work, starting from the, um, the initial drawings to the final painting. And I, I knew I was done when I couldn't do any more to it without changing it all over again. So it was kind of a nice feeling to say, the last couple hours I just spent with it without painting, you know, without working on it, just knowing that it was done. This is my moment of realizing that moment was a gift to me from higher power. And you've captured it, Pat, in a very emotional way for me. Yeah. Thank you. Here we have another question. I have two questions. Can you hear me? I have two questions. Um, one, are there going to be posters? And two, <laughs> um, did you have to get Bill's approval for, like, I mean, did you work on it and then in the end show him your final project or your product? Uh, this is a. Is this on? Yeah, you're good. Um, this is the first time Billy's seen it. So. And what was the other question? Will there be posters? Yes. Oh, yes. Will there be posters? Yes. We're we're going to have posters. We're going to have some um, uh, prints made on some very nice paper. Those will be available. And then there, it's called a G clay, which is a it's a print done on canvas. It'll be just like this, except it's a, it's a print. I'd like to understand the best way that my community, African Americans, can work together with Native Americans. There's so many resources that com our, your community and our communities have. And as I, you know, I met you earlier today and said, I've been following your story for 30 years. Um, and my father's a judge in Wisconsin where there are a lot of Native American communities. He focuses on family law. My mother's an urban planner. She's worked with a lot of Native American communities. I'm a lawyer. I was just explaining to them I had John Echo Hawk come speak to a group of lawyers. But I feel like there's, uh, I can't figure out how to get in front of a large group to talk about how we can share and exchange and really help one another. I think uh, for me it starts back when we all came out of Africa. We're all related. I think we need to realize we're in a rapidly changing world and anytime we face change we have to make people feel less threatened because if they're threatened they either retaliate or they attack and they miss that incredible opportunity to choreograph their individual and their collective journey into this vast universe of opportunity that ultimately awaits us. So I think it's a matter of communicating we were put in very awkward positions by our federal government because programs that were available to empower African American, Latino, Hispanic speaking, Mexicano, Native American, Asian American, poor white, we all had to compete for the same funding. And it was very, very complicated. It was very, very, uh, I think, uh, I'm going to speak mainly from a Native American standpoint. I think we need to be brought more into the mainstream of society and there are ways that could be done. Let's just take law. All 50 states, only two states to be an attorney and to practice law in the United States of America, only two states require proficiency in the three forms of law that exist in our country, federal, state, and Indian law. All 50 states need to have Indian law as a bar exam subject that would level the playing field, it would educate multitudes of people to where they could communicate more positively with one another. Just one other example. Two and a half to 20% of all of the cases before a United States Supreme Court today, year after year, in some way pertain to the violating of tribal sovereignty. We need to be brought into the mainstream of society. We need a Native American on the Supreme Court. We need, I say, John Echohawk, who's still not, he's still young enough to, to serve to, to great time on the U.S. Supreme Court. Why John Echohawk? Thurgood Marshall, 1929, comes out of law school, heads up NAACP, working through the legal court systems of America, changed the laws, eliminating Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896 Supreme Court ruling, white and black America, equal but separate, with Brown versus Board of Education. Our leaders spun off of that. We formed the Native American Rights Fund, NAACP, Thurgood Marshall. 
Native American Rights Fund, John Echohawk. Congress could understand and could be educated on the need for a Native American on the United States Supreme Court. We need all support. The next vacancy on the United States Supreme Court, one person being considered should be a Native American. But in order to even have that happen, we need African American support. So we need to work together to make America a better place. Actually, folks, it's time we have to wrap it up. So friends, if you could please join me in thanking the Mickasaw Cree First Nations, Steve McCasey, Mrs. Pat Mills, and Mr. Billy Mills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks for coming. Mickasaw Cree, Lawrence said for him what put it all together when he knew my dad said, you do these things, son, Someday you'll have wings of an eagle. Mikasu is the word, their word, for eagle. So he helped us put it all together. And thank you. Thank you all for coming, folks. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy your visit.